everybody, welcome to my homestead and welcome to my channel. In this video, I'm responding to an email from Ann Cox. Uh, it is something from Hugh Nibley's book. I, I haven't even read it yet. I haven't read it. She sent it. She sent me some stuff to read and I'm just going to read it right here, right now. Does that disturb you that I'm winging it? <laughs> uh, before I do that, uh, I've had some people respond to my last video. I was doing a call out to any sisters in the church that uh, either have or want to start YouTube channels because I'm offering to do an interview or even just a shout out to your channel so that you can get, get up and going. Go watch my previous video, but if you're interested, if you're if you're a sister and you're interested in doing a YouTube channel or you, you're looking to uh, increase your um, subscribers, then let me know. Uh, the reason why, just in a nutshell, is there's been a number of talks within recent years that have been calling out to the sisters to basically stand up and uh, stand out, be an example to the world, because they are going to be the driving force behind a lot of the growth in the church uh, in the days ahead. So I want to do my part to help that effort. I think a big um, part of it or an important tool is social media. Uh, social media can be bad, but it can also be really good. And so I think that we can use it for good. So if you at all feel like you, you'd like to do a YouTube channel or if you already have one going, but you'd like to maybe have some more subscribers, email me. My email is in the description of every video and we'll set up a time and do an interview and get you some exposure. Uh, now there's two people that have responded that already have YouTube channels. Uh, one person is Wild Dubik. She only has two videos so far. Uh, from what I, sorry, I already forgot the email, but I think uh, COVID kind of stopped things for her and she's thinking about maybe doing it again. So I'll put the link for her channel down in the description. So please subscribe uh, to encourage her to get going. Uh, maybe once she sees some people subscribing, she'll it'll um, drive her to to get up and going. And that that would be a very good thing. And then we have another channel. It's called The Sunday Family Adventures. And she was telling me that she wants to start doing more gospel related things. Okay. It's her and her family. They're the Sundays. That's their last name. And she wants to share more about the gospel. So please support her. They're at 964 subscribers. Uh, please, please, for all that is good, please do it to encourage these people to continue to share their, or, you know, share their testimonies and reach out there into the world to help spread the gospel and get more exposure for the church uh, among the people of the world. Um, so uh, again, I'll put both of these. It's Wild Dubik and the, the Sunday Family Adventures. Uh, I'll put the links in the description below so you can go and subscribe to them. And you know what? I'll do it right now. Look, look I'm doing it right now on this video. Look, subscribe. And then, no, in fact, even better than that, notification bell, all. And then we'll do it for Wild Dubik too. We'll take her from five subscribers to six notification bell boom it's as easy as that so so please please subscribe to them okay so this is a email from ann cox she says i had the thought to send these uh to you from hugh monkey's book i think she meant hugh nibley's maybe she was talking on the phone uh and the phone didn't quite pick up the last name uh hugh nibley's book in that you would know what to do with them. Oh, I, I sure do. I'm doing it right now. I hope this helps you in your journey to understand the architecture pattern you're seeing. Now, I, I'm back. I'm still back in March with my emails. So I apologize to everybody that I'm not more human than human, but I'm just human. And this is all that I can do. Um, but I will get through them all. And I think she's talking about when we were exploring uh, um, basically this architectural style that seems to show up with really important temples uh, not that i mean all temples are important but i'm talking about like the salt lake temple i'm talking about the uh, independence visitor center which according to alvin r dyer uh, in his diary 
uh, it's meant to be a, potentially meant to be a temple in the future for New Jerusalem um, as part of the 24 Temple Complex. You'll have to. I have a whole playlist for that for the Independence Visitor Center if you want more details on that. But and then the BYU Jerusalem Center, which is not meant to be a temple, but the Lord can do anything He wants. And maybe during the millennium, He'll turn it into a temple. Maybe Jerusalem will have a, its own temple complex. Uh, who knows? We don't know what's going to happen. But one thing that I notice is that these temples they have this very interesting feature where they have these arches. And uh, specifically, you call it a, an arcade. When you have a series of arches, uh, it's called an arcade. And um, so she's she's talking about, you know what, let me just pull it up so you can see it. Independence Visitor Center. Uh, sorry. Oh, oh, there it is right there. Okay, see? You see the arcade of the Independence Visitor Center? And then BYU Jerusalem Center. Okay, images, pull this up. There it is right there. See, see the arcade? You look at the Salt Lake Temple. And uh, it's not exactly the same where like you don't walk through the arches and you're still not inside the building, but the Salt Lake Temple, it has a lot of, um, another name for it is a Roman arch, this kind of shape right here. But you'll notice that all around the whole Salt Lake Temple, you have these arches. And, you know, the argument can be made, oh, they're, they're just trying to make it look nice. It's just a architectural style. It's appropriate for uh, temples. And that could be true. But what, what I've noticed, again, is that is if this is meant to be a temple in the future, and if this becomes a temple in the future, um, the, well, they, they look pretty similar. And... There's also been the, so those are both capital, future capital cities, right? Um, during the millennium, Jerusalem and New Jerusalem. Well, when we look at the capital of Brazil, okay, LDS, Brasilia, Brazil temple. Here's another capital city, but this time of a country, Brazil. And what do you know? You have a very similar looking building. Okay. So, um, you know, I, I've done a lot on this. It, it may be something, it may not. But I have a lot on it, so just go check out those two playlists, BYU Jerusalem Center and Independence Visitor Center playlists for more information where we go even deeper. There's a lot to it. So this this video that I'm doing now is basically going to be become a part of that, of both of those um, playlists. Okay, so... Uh, she says, I'm also attaching a link to Michael B. Rush video that I think you would enjoy. Very pretty powerful. Uh, thank you. I, I'm, I'm very, very familiar with Michael B. Rush, and we are, um, I think, worlds apart with some of our interpretations of things. Of course, when it comes to the important things like the gospel, of course, we're united, but he has very different interpretations on um, certain prophecies and scripture. Uh, although, as far as Ezra's Eagle goes, I, I'm not sure right now what to think about that. I want to read it for myself. I, I don't really like to go off other people's uh, interpretation. I, I like to listen to other people, but then I want to do the research myself and just verify it. And I haven't had a chance to do that with Ezra's Eagle. Maybe I'll do a video on that in the future. So, and then she says, thanks for putting out your wonderful videos and for being such a humble teacher. Well, humble, I, I don't know about <laughs> I try. Um, I really enjoy watching them. They are honest, heartfelt, lighthearted, and informative. Um, well, some would say that they're, uh, you know, uh, I'm just winging it. And uh, <laughs> just kidding. I had a commenter a couple videos ago. Uh, I'm not going to say his name. I just call him um, <laughs> Lord Byron Esquire, who uh, was giving me some some hassle about my style. I'm just, this is how I do it. It's working. My channel is growing uh, quite a bit, so I'm not going to change this formula, and it works for me. It makes it so I can put out more information. So anyway, I love that you look up and read info you find. Yeah, I, well, I think that's important because I think that we need to go to the source. We need to find, we need to, it's great to, I think it's fine to speculate and think out loud and 
Um, but I think it's more powerful when you go to the actual source of information. That's how you do research. You know, when you go to college, you don't just say things. You you back it up with sources of information. Uh, so, you know, you, you put references in your papers. And uh, that's what I do with my YouTube is I want to go to the actual source of different things and then put the reference down in the description so you can go check it out, maybe expand your your study into that or just verify what I'm saying, maybe read it for yourself, you know, whatever. Okay. I listen because I have small children, 10 children total. Wow. That, that is a lot nowadays. And frankly, I wish that I had more children. It, it just didn't work out. Uh, I'm hoping that during the millennium, I can have more children, uh, honestly, because I, I want many, 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 ch I'd love families. But um, that's good for you. And listening helps me continue to learn the gospel while I'm doing my daily work. Smiley face. Sincerely, Ann Cox. Okay, so let's take a look at what at the pictures that she sent. Here's the cover of the book. Hugh Nibley, uh, the collected works of Hugh Nibley, volume 16. The message of the, message of the Joseph Smith papyri in Egyptian endowment. Man... I want, oh, I want to read all those. I need more money. I need to make more money. I, I want to read all those. I want to buy that. Okay, let's let's read it. Okay, commentary part three: the creation, resurrection of man. I'll start with this paragraph here. It is common throughout the ancient world to speak of the sun as rising and setting at certain gates. And the sundial from Moreau, shaped like a megalithic tri uh, trilithon, trilithon, shows us how old those gates could be. Quote, I know the gate in the midst of heaven by which Re comes forth in the east, says the candidate in Coffin Text 159. Such gates are often mentioned in the Apocrypha, uh, with their Egyptian taste for cosmism. Thus, the sun and the moon have a fixed series of gates for their risings and settings. Quote, the Lord made these gates and thus provided in the sun the device for measuring the hours of the year. While the moon has its own series of 12 gates. It has its own series of 12 gates. Enoch, Enoch reports that he, quote, has measured the circle of the sun and numbered its rays and its entrances and exits and all of its movements. And done the same, oh, it kind of cuts off, done the same for sun windows, served the same purpose as the gates, allow for more exact measurements. Horace presents when books, when he looks through a hole at something, uh, kind of cuts off toward the bottom, but you get the idea. Okay, let's move on to the next page. Um, in Egyptian temples, gates, window. So here's, well, okay. So here's two, I don't know what you would call them, not pillars, two, well, maybe kind of pillar type things. And then you have like an entrance here at the bottom. And then underneath here, you have the ark. So I, I guess if this is like a, well, let's just read it. Figure 83, this small inlaid wooden sundial reinforces the idea of the sun rising between pylons oh, okay pylons as shown by the sun disk over the doorway um okay let's move on here oh okay she took a picture okay so we can read it okay and done the same for the moon in egyptian temple in, in egyptian temples sun windows serve the same purpose as sun windows serve the same purpose as the gates windows being smaller could allow for more exact measurements horace presides over certain creative ceremonies when he looks through a hole at something very white on the other side and quote the wounding of the eye of tebi solar eclipse is calculated by the counting of holes uh, we can conclude without any doubt according to francois uh, Dalmas, that the sun comes comes forth out of the celestial ocean, as indicated in the poem of the windows, by illuminating with its nine rays the temple of uh, Dendera, 
announces the periodic return or of the order of light triumphant over the darkness of chaos. A variation on the theme is the royal window of appearance of appearance at which Pharaoh would appear to the people as the sun shining between the two great front pylons. In the Babylonian Enuma Elish, the various heavenly bodies have their windows through which they make their appearance. In these arrangements, the... Okay, now we're on something completely different. Um, the Egyptians were careful students of the solar disk in all its aspects, which changed constantly during the day. Now, let me stop here because I don't know... I don't know exactly how it all worked out, but when, when we read in the Pearl of Great Price, we learn that Abraham taught astronomy to the Egyptians. So all this stuff that they do, you know, of course, the scholarship would be like, no, this is just part of civilization, that this is how ancient peoples, blah, blah, blah. but I'd like to know how much of this was learned from Abraham. For some, for some reason, Abraham taught the Egyptians Astronomy. I, I don't know for what purpose. I think that the Lord even told him to. Let's see. Abraham taught astronomy to the e Egyptians. Oh, well, here's, an, here's a BYU article. Encircling astronomy and the Egyptians, an approach to Abraham 3. Uh, by Kerry Mulstein. Oh, by the way, he this is the guy, he was interviewed by my friend Troy Abels from the Last Dispensation channel. Let me pull this up. If you haven't subscribed to Troy, I would recommend doing that. The Last Dispensation. That is his top video right here. That he has as the trailer he did a video with this person right here carrie mulstein so subscribe to troy as well add him to your list of people to follow um he's basically my one of my best friends here on on youtube um, i haven't talked to him in a long time but i've done a number of interviews with him i have a playlist where i have for uh it's called special guests so if you want to see my interviews with him with palmer with other people with um um uh, tyler cragen from the greatest cause channel and, and others go to that playlist but you might want to check out this video that he, that he did where he interviewed carrie molstein okay so i want to read some of this okay this is a quote from orson f whitney I have long held the view that the universe is built upon symbols whereby one one thing bespeaks another. The lesser testifies of the greater, uh, lifting our thoughts from man to God, from heaven or from earth to heaven, from time to eternity. God teaches with symbols. It is his favorite method of teaching. Yeah, and we know that when we go to the temple, it's it's all about symbols. Symbols are uh it's a way to encode information but also you know there's certain symbols that just they represent they just inherently represent truth just fundamental truth you think about geometry squares circles it doesn't matter what world you live in or what universe it's always going to have those are always going to have the same meaning Okay, that, that's why symbols are important because uh, they don't necessarily require language. Uh, they're, they're like their own fundamental language. So, okay, Abraham 3 is one of the most enigmatic sections of the Pearl of Great Price. Teacher and student together sense there is something more, the text, more to the text than the meaning uh, they are drawing out of it. Each through exploration, uh, gently nudges another layer of understanding from the text, but we always feel we have unraveled only the smallest portion of what it has to offer. Yeah, that's how I have felt um, with a lot of the great, the Pearl of Great Price. Though I do not pretend to have a great key to unlock this revelation, I believe there are some appreciative principles that cast light on Abraham's night vision. 
Certainly, teachers can take a variety of approaches when teaching Abraham 3. Most students will be curious about the exotic names provided in verses 3 and 13, and it is worth time to address these questions. Investigations into the Egyptians' astronomical abilities and how Abraham may have contributed to these abilities are also worthwhile. See, now that's what that's what we're wondering, wondering about here. Undoubtedly, the Egyptians of Abraham's day conceived of a geocentric cosmos, <clears throat> meaning that, you know, the earth is at the center, with particular emphasis on that, quote, which the sun encircles, denoting the earth. In many aspects, Abraham's vision appears to be geocentric. Uh, yet Abraham also gains a, quote, colob-centric view of the universe. However, some aspects of Egyptian astrono or astronomical thought are not centric at all. It is even possible that the vision, <clears throat> excuse me, the vision fits no known astronomic approach because the Lord may have shown Abraham a model not yet understood by modern astronomers. So <laughs> we're starting to go kind of deep here, aren't we? Uh, I, I've told you before that I've I've looked into all different um, theories about secret combinations, modern day Gadiant robbers, and one person is like, well, have you looked into the one that has to do with uh, the Earth and uh, how the Earth is actually designed and shaped? And yeah, of course, I've lo I've looked into all of them, and I don't necessarily accept that one per se, but I will say that there's something suspicious or odd or strange when it comes to space. Um, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not making any declarations here, but <clears throat> I find it odd that, for example, we haven't been back to the moon. Uh, I, I, know, I know all the official reasons why that is, but it still seems suspicious to me. Um, it, it would seem to me that by now we should be a spacefaring uh, civilization, and we are in the sense that we, you know, we regularly go to low Earth orbit. But I mean, like beyond that. And I know that there are uh, plans. People have plans. We we were recently talking about Elon Musk. He wants to have a million person city uh, on Mars in, in the near future, like within this century. Uh, we have private space flight that's starting to take off, uh, no pun intended, but something still seems off. Like It's almost as though we don't know everything about space, and I, I feel like maybe if we knew the entire truth, maybe we would be shocked. I, again, I do not hold that theory, okay, that theory about the Earth. But I am also very open-minded, and we may not have a complete understanding of things. And who knows how secret combinations have played a hand in that uh, with our conception of space. So, so that's all I'm going to say. That's all I'm going to say. Don't think anything crazy um, about me, but just something seems weird. Something seems kind of weird to me. Okay, um... It is even possible that the vision fits no known astronomic approach because the Lord may, may have shown Abraham a model not yet understood by modern astronomers. Now, wouldn't that be interesting if that was true? However, I think we stumble when we attempt to understand Abraham's vision in terms of astronomic paradigms. It is quite likely that the Lord was describing astronomy and the heavens allegorically, in order to teach doctrinal, not astronomical principles. While attempting to understand astronomical principles has merit, though inconclusive attempts have certainly been used against us, and while there may be an understandable cosmic paradigm to be, te to te to be teased out of the narrative, it seems that the allegorical teachings are the weightier matters as far as the gospel classroom is concerned. Abraham was no beginner in astronomy. He tells us he has the records of the fathers, and these records contain 
quote, a knowledge of the cr beginning of the creation and also of the planets and of the stars as they were made known unto the fathers. Which is interesting. So it was made known to them, to the to the patriarchs. Why? Why? You know, and again, think about the temple. Think about the allegorical nature of some of these things, like what he's saying here. Uh, it's it's all it's all very fascinating. It's all very fascinating. Abraham continues by making it clear that the information he records is quote for the benefit of his posterity in Abraham 131. As such, we must not only ask ourselves what the knowledge provided in Abraham 3 meant to those in Abraham's time, but also what he meant for us, his latter-day posterity, to derive from it. This requires both an intensive investigation into Abraham's era and into the ramifications of the vision for our day. It is interesting to note that Abraham appears to have two distinct visions, one via the Urim and Thummim and recorded in the first part of chapter three, and the second as he speaks with the Lord face to face, beginning somewhere between verses 10 to 12. It is unclear when Abraham goes from hearing the Lord via the Urim and Thummim to talking with him face to face. In fact, the first part of the chapter may not have been a vision, but may have been may have consisted of Abraham viewing the stars with his naked eye and conversing with the Lord about what he saw by means of the Urim and Thummim. The second part is surely a vision. Uh, in each of these, Abraham sees something of the cosmic system, which the Lord then uses uh, perceptively to teach doctrinal principles. In both visions, the principles taught are similar but the first vision seems to discuss these principles on a more general level, and the second one, a more specific level. To elucidate the lessons the Lord is teaching Abraham and teaching us through Abraham, we must first ask some questions. Okay, now before we continue with this, well, I want to finish off the email. So, it, it, it's just, it's interesting. You know, because talking about these gates of the sun, the moon, things like that, and then thinking about it in the allegorical sense, in possibly having these things encoded in our temples, you know, with these arcades, windows, things like that, these these shapes. Um, there may be a lot more here encoded in these temples than than what we're aware, you know. Um, you also has to you also have to think about things like when the Lord reveals for certain temples how they're supposed to be constructed, uh, the dimensions of them. For example, for the new Jer the New Jerusalem twenty four temple complex, uh, Joseph Smith was he received revelation on how how big those buildings were supposed to be. And so, in turn, when they built this, they made it to those same specifications because they wanted to have a building here that could be turned into a temple uh, if that turns out to be the case. If, if um, some revelation comes along, uh, if the time comes along when we can build the temples here, they wanted this to be able to be converted into a temple. And so the the area, the the width and the length uh, are according to the specifications that Joseph Smith received in Revelation. And you have to wonder about when things like that are given, uh, obviously it's for a reason, and most likely they're given because they have symbolic meaning, right? As far as the arcades go, I don't know, but with what we're looking at, could these be representative of sun and moon gates? Could it be representative? And then in turn, could that be just representative of things like, you know, when we read about the New Jerusalem having 12 gates, one for each of the 12 tribes of Israel, um, there, there's definitely some kind of spiritual thing going on. The, the, the fact that there are 12 tribes of Israel in that we're sorted out into these 12 tribes and how 
12, it matches up with 12 months of the year. It matches up with the 12 um, signs of the zodiac. And I'm not talking about astrology, like horoscopes. The, the, the signs of the zodiac, the, it, it's basically a map of the skies. Even though, like, I usually cringe when I hear words like Pisces or Scorpio because I, I, you along with me, we probably initially associate that with horoscopes and the new age, but in reality, they're they're sky, they're maps of the sky, and they've been used for a long time. From what I've researched, it seems that the current ones that we have um, uh, originate uh, from <clears throat> from Babylon in their astronomy. But uh, they're not, from what I understand, they're not exactly clear on where it originally, originally comes from. It's hard to pin down. So anyway, the point is, when it comes to time, when it comes to space, when it comes to astronomy, when it comes to the 12 tribes of Israel, when it comes to temples, there's a lot of symbolism, there's a lot of correspondence, there's a lot of parallels, and there's a lot of allegory. That's, that's all I'm trying to say. So it just makes you kind of wonder about the architecture that's chosen for some of these buildings. Um, may, maybe if, if not all of them. So, and there may think there may be things that we're not even aware of yet. What what if something is like revealed during the millennium? It's like, did you know that every single temple has this? Uh, th this is something that I have not revealed until this time. Things like that could happen. You don't know. I don't know. Okay, so. Okay, the Egyptians measured the motions of the heavens and especially of the sun with reference to certain established markers on the earth. Uh, their sun clocks used both shadows and beams of light. Even the traveling Egyptian had his portable sun watch. The best known alignment is the, I don't know what that's called, symbol of the sun rising exactly between two mountains. The entrance to every temple was a stately pylon arranged like the two mountains so that the sun would rise exactly between them at the turn of the year or the equinoxes. Uh, <clears throat> over the main gate was the symbol of the winged disc rising on its wing, rising on its wings, the gate itself forming the same design as the primitive um, trilithon of the megalithic temple. Indeed, tradition, <clears throat> excuse me, tr indeed, tradition identified the pillars of the temple with the standing stones or quote unquote ghosts left by the ancestors as, quote, the place in which the things of the earth were filled with power. As is obvious to all, the sides of the Egyptian pylons are not vertical, uh, but always sloping. This, says Pierre Gilbert, is because they converge toward a point very high in the sky above the temple, a point toward which, okay, and that's it. So, Interesting things, interesting things, and uh, this right here in it, itself, these uh, pylons seem to have significance in you know when you when you look at different if if you if you look into secret combinations, modern day Gadiant and robbers. Uh, you start to learn some of the symbols and occult meanings and different things, right? And th the ones today, the secret combination people today, they're really big on Egypt, okay? They're really, really big on Egypt. And uh, it's kind of creepy, but it, it goes back to these this like ancient knowledge and symbolism and stuff like that. And... Um, if you if you've looked into the the free uh, Brotherhood Club, you know that you know two pillars, two columns, two whatever is important to them. Uh, I, I, it seems to be derived from the Temple of Solomon, and we know that Egypt had kind of like a uh, I guess a counterfeit or they they mimicked the priesthood. Right, so there, there's like aspects of truth, it seems, within Egyptian mythology that corresponds. It, it, it was basically a false priesthood, and we learn about that in the Pearl of Great Price, right? So, 
there's interesting connections I think that you could draw between Egyptian mythology and truth and symbolism. Sorry, I know I'm kind of just like blabbering. It's I don't know how to word this the best way, but hopefully you get what I'm saying, right? And some people think that um, let's see. No, I'm not going to go there. <laughs> But something that happened in 2001, they, they think that that may be connected because think of two, you know, pillars, pylons, and uh, anyway, you can go down that that path if you want to. Maybe you've already gone down that path, but okay, yeah, all right. So let's go back here. Purposes of astronomy. To understand the symbols the Lord is using in this revelation to Abraham, we must ask ourselves, why is the Lord talking to Abraham about the stars. While the Lord often teaches his prophets about the heavens, he does not always teach the same thing in each encounter. For example, when Moses learns of God's many creations, it is to help him understand the vastness of God's great work and mankind's centrality to that work. While we do not know what Joseph Smith learned about the heavens from God, it is clear he learned something that helped him understand the degrees of glory to which mankind is headed. But why was Abraham shown a vision of the stars and planets? What was the point? The Lord himself partially answers the question, quote, Abraham, I show these things unto thee before you go into Egypt, that ye may declare all these words. Uh, what words did the Lord want Abraham to declare? If the Lord is referring to the words he uses to describe the rotations of Kolob, the earth, the moon, and other celestial bodies, it is possible the Lord simply wanted Abraham to teach the Egyptians astronomy. The Genesis account of Abraham's visit to Egypt emphasizes that Abraham was enriched there. Perhaps the Lord used Abraham's astro astronomic awareness to introduce him to Pharaoh's court, where he could be made wealthy and thus return to the promised land in a position of power. However, the phrase, quote unquote, all these words, indicates that Abraham was to teach not only astronomy, but also, also gospel principles the Lord explained through astronomic means. So, you see, that's interesting. Uh, why? Why? Because I, I don't know. There are certain topics you just can't really talk about. We, we know that Egypt in those days they were they were descended from ham the the three sons of noah right ham japheth shem and so i don't know i i don't know i, I this is getting way too deep. this is getting really deep really fast um i don't know Okay, it's just interesting. So that's what he was told to do. Egyptian symbols. If this is the case, why did the Lord choose astronomy as the symbolic medium of his message? Why is this subscribed to this set of symbols? Of course, the Lord has not given us a direct answer to this question, yet there are some things we can reason out with a certain degree of confidence. While this is not the place for a detailed investigation into Egyptian astronomy, some ideas are worth highlighting so we may understand the magnitude of the symbolic language Abraham was to employ in Egypt. It is indisputable that the Egyptians set significance to the movements and domains of celestial bodies. Right. Uh, for instance, after the annual disappearance of Cyrus, uh, Sopdet, the Egyptians knew that the re-rising of the dog star generally co coincided with the annual flood of the Nile. The flood of the Nile was a type of rebirth, and thus the rebirth of the star was a harbinger of the rebirth that Egypt experienced each year. Cyrus was also believed to serve as a guide to the deceased as, the journey, as they journeyed through the stars. Uh, the Egyptians designated Cyrus, or sorry, Sirius, did I say Cyrus? Sirius, as one of the 36 stars known as Deccans, or Deacons? Deccans. Because of the helical role they played in a complex calendar system in which one Deccan replaced another every 10 days. Uh, our knowledge of this system stems from, a astrono astronomic, from astronomic paintings on a series of coffins 
from just before Abraham's time. These paintings make it clear that in Abraham's day, the Egyptians placed significance on the movement of the stars. This is further reflected in one of the long-standing titles of the head priest of Heliopolis, uh, biblical On, so in the Bible, I guess it's known as On or On, uh, was known as the chief observer. Okay, so they looked at the stars. Uh, there was uh, Sirius was a series of 36 stars known as deacons or decans. They were placed every 10 days and then they they attached meaning to those stars. And we were just given one, for example, with Sirius being the the sign of oh the the, the uh, Nile is gonna flood. it's gonna be reborn. okay. Many planets and stars played a particularly important role in Egyptian culture. Their gods were believed to have left the earth to reside in the sky. The moon was associated with the god Thoth. Uh, by the way, uh, Marvel, the, the series that they, <laughs> they just came out with on Disney+, Plus, it has everything to do with Thoth. Uh, it's called Moon Knight. And it's, again, just like many other Marvel movies and other just... Hollywood in general, it's it's chock full with things that are designed to, um, you know, get you to, to think certain ways. I kind of covered it a little bit a few videos ago, but it's interesting because uh, you go watch that right now and Thoth shows up. So anyway, the moon was associated with the god Thoth, the sun with Ra, and Orion with the god Osiris. Of particular import to the king, who was associated with Horus, were the planets Jupiter, Saturn, and Mars, which were also associated with Horus. Moreover, the king would have paid particular attention to what Abraham had to say about, quote, the greater light, which is set to rule the day, because the king was integrally tied to Ra, the sun, and its journey. Information about the stars was also important to the king. Stars such as Gemini, and Deneb were seen as significant markers in the known course of the sun through the stars. Uh, yeah, the sun through the stars. One of the most important, one of the most prolific of early kinship images was the belief that the king was destined to become one of the circumpolar stars, the Imwusk, the stars that did not know destruction because they did not disappear. Oh yeah, so so. Yeah, so basically the stars that are always uh, visible, essentially that don't that don't go um, below the horizon. Yeah, okay. So the okay in the afterlife, the king could also become Cyrus. Additionally, Cyrus was seen as his sister, which may be explained by references in which si sorry, Sirius. My gosh, what what's wrong with me? Uh, explained by references in which Sirius is also identified with Isis. Yeah, because because um, th because that, that's how it goes. Osiris and Isis they're 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 married, but they're brother and sister. Um, okay, so whereas the dead king uh, is Osiris. Furthermore, Sirius was associated with the king's daughter and the king's father. Orion was described both as Orion was described both as the king and as the king's brother, and Venus as his daughter and his guide. Amenemhet <laughs> Amen III, <laughs> a likely contemporary of Abraham, wrote on the top of his pyramid that he was higher than the heights of Orion. These few references amply illustrate the point the Egyptian king and his court were aware of and keenly interested in the movements of the sun, moon, planets, and stars. In our era of large cities and electric lights, it is hard to picture how these celestial bodies were part of Egyptian life. Most students do not regularly see starry nights because of light pollution. The, the natural nocturnal luminaries were particularly striking in, in Egypt, where most nights were cloudless and very clear. The lustrous bodies of the night sky were overlarge. They dominated the 
dominated the, the night landscape and forced their way into the minds and visions of every Egyptian soul. They were a much greater and pressing presence for these ancient inhabitants than most of us would naturally assume. Because of this powerful intrusive sight, the stars spoke loudly to the, to the Egyptians, whether they wanted them to or not. Their movements and power were an inescapable noise raining upon the eyes of our ancient counterparts. In my estimation, this is why Abraham would find the language of the stars to be a meaningful mode of communication with the Egyptians. In modern missionary parlance, this astronomy enabled Abraham to build on common ground, and his expertise in the area helped him build a relationship of trust. If the Lord wanted to find ground that was both common and persuasive as a vehicle for teaching Pharaoh and his people about the gospel, astronomy was an effective choice, not only because the Egyptians would be interested, nor solely because they were accustomed to celestial bodies carrying symbolic teachings, but also because the movements and principles of the stars and planets lend themselves to a powerful message. Essentially, the Lord was teaching Abraham and the Egyptians by symbolism, as he often does. As we recognize and understand these symbols, we need not unlock information regarding this specific revelation to Abraham, but we also become more familiar with the language of symbolism. Working through these, uh, through these symbols equips our students to work through others on their own. It should help students develop both scriptural abilities and confidence in those abilities. Uh, there's another lesson to be learned when we see the pains to which the Lord goes to help one of his greatest prophets to be prepared to share the gospel among a strange people, we realize how important this is to him. In recording this experience for his posterity, Abraham emphasizes to us how much the Lord wants him to be prepared to keep the charge within the Abrahamic covenant to make the Lord's name known throughout the earth. Here we see Abraham going through the Lord's missionary training center. He is, <clears throat> excuse me, he is motivated to share the gospel and he is equipped with both a message and tools such as building on common ground as, as he shares that message. I would be interested to find out how many Egyptians uh, followed Abraham because it seems to me that basically Abraham, he had his family, um, he had wives, he had children, but he also had, you know, a whole group of people. He was a powerful person. He was wealthy. And so he had essentially a people, uh, w which included servants, but it, the, the way it seems to me is that he, they were also with him religiously. Uh, maybe I shouldn't talk more about that, but that's my picture of Abraham is that he had a group with him that were part of his uh, household. And I, I just wonder if any Egyptians chose to join his household and, and follow him. I don't know. Governing points of the universe. To elucidate the principles taught by this astronomical message, I've created concentric circle models as visual aids. Uh, though we do not know if the Egyptians employed the idea of concentric, concentric circles at this time. Creating these models force, forces one to ask whether the governing body should be drawn at the center or as the outermost sphere. A good case can be made for both models. As noted, astronomy at the time was viewed geocentrically. So this would put the Earth at the center of the model with the greater bodies in the outer orbits. This model would have been particularly meaningful to the Egyptians. With our modern astronomical viewpoint, we tend to think of the center as the point of control or governance. The sun is the center of our solar system, governing the system by its gravitational pull. The sun is revolving around a central gravitational point in our galaxy, likely a black hole. Uh, yeah, that's that, that's what they say currently. That last time I checked, they they think that there's a massive black hole that's at the center of the galaxy, and that's what's holding it all together. And even the galaxies are revolving around a central gravitational pull in our super cluster of galaxies. And yet, in the Lord's analogy given to the Egyptians through Abraham, if the Earth is at the center, 
then it is not the central point that governs, but the outermo outermost point that ins that encircles all else. This is in line. This is aligned with Egyptian thinking in many respects, though it seems contrary to a geocentric point of view. For for the Egyptians, encircling something was a powerful symbol of controlling or ruling over it, often including an element of protecting uh, that was encircled. Often including an element of protecting what was encircled. So see, this is interesting here, because again, think about geometry, think about circles, right? Think about squares and stuff like that. Uh, power over creation was shown by Ra, who encircled the earth. Uh, the deceased wished to have such power by going about the two heavens, encircling the two lands. The deceased king is pictured as more powerful than even the gods by describing him as one who has encircled every god in your arms, their land, <clears throat> excuse me, their lands and all their possessions. O king, you are great. You are wrapped around like the circle which encircles the great rulers. In Egyptian thought, um, it is that which encircles that controls, not that which is in the center. Thus, in a geocentric model, the vision given the vision given Abraham places God at the outer orbits. That's interesting. That is interesting. It's interesting. Okay. On the other hand, there is some evidence that we would do best to draw Kolob or the governing point at the center of our model. Michael Rhodes has suggested an etymology for Kolob as coming from the Semitic root QLB, which has the basic meaning of heart, center, middle. This is corroborated by Joseph Smith's explanation of the center figure of the hypocephalus, hypocephalus in facsimile 2 as Kolob. These ideas indicate a model with Kolob at the center. The central point of any model is completely a matter of perspective. The Earth orbits the Sun, but from our perspective, it appears the Sun circles the Earth. Okay, so it's a matter of perspective. Uh, because, because Pharaoh already conceived of the Sun circling the Earth and other significant bodies moving in cyclical journeys around the Earth and Sun, he would have easily understood the concept that heavenly orbs revolved around each other in concentric circles. Thus, the information given to Abraham in verses 3 through 7 would have made perfect sense. For each known orb, there was another above it until the governing body was reached. Pharaoh could, e could easily picture a cosmos which looked like thus. So here you have it. Uh, I guess this would be the sun, the the furthermost um, sphere or not, or you know circle. In the end, we cannot know which way Abraham or the Egyptians would have drawn their models with the governing point at the center or as the body which encircles all else. I have chosen to make my illustrations with the governing point at the center because it is the most intuitive model. For us, saying that God is at the center means he is the focal governing point. And pedagogically, pedagogically, <laughs> this is preferable. Thus, for our purposes, the cosmos Abraham was explaining could look like figure two. This picture of the cosmos helps us visualize that Abraham, what Abraham was teaching Pharaoh. The crucial information came in verses eight and nine. Quote, and there were these two, and where these two facts exist, there shall be another fact above them. That is, there shall be another planet whose reckoning of time shall be longer still. And thus, there shall be the reckoning of the time of one planet above another until thou come nigh unto Kolob, which Kolob is after the reckoning of the Lord's time, which Kolob is set nigh unto the throne of God to govern all these planets which belong to the same order as that upon which thou standest. 
here the concept of orbiting planets and their governing times was used as used as a used as a perception to explain that a being not a planet was the governing source oh yeah because it says god not not planet but god himself this would give the glorious this would give the glorious egyptian king something to think about that it's god it's not it's not planets um, he would have clearly understood that there were many rulers upon the earth and that they possess possess differing mag differing magnitudes of power for example the egyptians knew of a canaanite ruler in jerusalem but considered him subservient to egypt and thus he would have he would have been considered to be one of the lesser orbits of rulers pharaoh probably also knew of mesopotamian kings uh, perhaps king ur namu of the city of ur this leader would likely have been viewed as occupying an orbit closer to the egyptian ruler the nubian king of kush had become powerful by this time but again the egyptians dominated this group the probability is great that the egyptian king considered himself to be the body that governed the orbits of leadership the great centrifugal centrifugal power controlling earthly leaders so see here's uh, like a graphic uh, figure three pharaoh centered universe so <laughs> spheres of uh, influence control whatever what would have been startling yet logical was the reasoning that if there were two facts one higher than another and there must be yet another higher still thus if if pharaoh was above the king of cush it stood to reason that someone was above pharaoh abraham's assertion would have been that this series of secessions continued not merely until pharaoh was reached but until god was reached the paradigm presented to pharaoh was that he was not the most high ruler after all <laughs> and so here you have god is above them all <laughs> so sorry pharaoh <laughs> sorry um the teaching of astronomy would be would have gotten the king's attention the principles of government apperceptively taught would have made sense this allowed abraham to teach that mankind must fear god not man even a man considered semi-divine like like pharaoh right but the lesson did not necessarily stop there these concentric circles of governance and order could also be used to teach of the organization of the kingdom of god on earth which in abraham's day operated under the patriarchal order thus we abraham and pharaoh understand that we follow the orbits of governance from ourselves to our parents grandparents and so forth until uh, the person who reports to god is reached and thus we gain we again find god as the focal governing point okay so son my wife and i our parents our grandparents and then all the way back to god okay incidentally this can be used to understand current church government as well demonstrating that the symbolism in abraham 3 speaks not only of abraham's generation but to ours as well home teacher uh, which now is ministering teachers uh, elders quorum president which you should also put the relief society president there bishop stake president council of the 12 first presidency and then god in the middle church government god in the middle this god-centered view of the universe teaches abraham the egyptians and us another powerful message even within a gospel context it's easy to focus on various principles without tying them in to the greater the great center god for example it is easy to discuss to discuss modesty honesty the word of wisdom or the law of tithing without connecting them to the center of the gospel god his son and the atonement even such edifying principles as these can be distracting if they are disassociated from the central focus president boyd k packer described the atonement as being the very root of christian doctrine you may know much about the gospel as it branches out from there but if you only know the branches and those branches do not touch that root if they have been cut free from the truth 
there will be no life or substance nor redemption in them. As Thomas B. Griffith said in a BYU devotional, quote, if you cannot figure out the link between the topic uh, you, are, you are to teach and the atonement of Christ, you have neither thought about it enough or you shouldn't be talking about it at church, end quote. When properly understood, the God-centered vision that Abraham 3 presents us should help us remember that every aspect of the gospel is governed by its great center, God, his son, and the atonement. The analogies of, Ab of Abraham is able to draw from the heavens increase because God seems to immediately show him an expanded vision of his creations. Quote, and he said unto me, my son, my son, and his hand was stretched out. Behold, I will show you all these. And he put his hand upon mine eyes, and I saw those things which his hands had made, which were many, and they multiplied before in mine eyes, and I could not see the end thereof. End quote. Not only did Abraham see more in the vision, but God also taught him more. Okay, I'm actually not going to finish the rest of this, but clearly this is a very good paper to read. So if you want to finish it, I'll put it in the description below. So symbolism, right? Um, I would really, really like to know more about the symbolism in the temple, not only the architecture, but also what we what we learn in the temple. It's very deep. And um, there's different ways that you can do that. It should, it should always be with the spirit and praying, you know, but you can, um, you know, pr pray for direction, pray about specific symbols and different things that you see and hear, and you'll find those answers. But yeah, I think there is something to the architecture, and I really appreciate uh, what you shared with us and Cox, because uh, this is something, something else to think about and consider. Hope you all enjoyed this. Uh, again, um, if you're a sister in the church, you're thinking about doing a YouTube channel, contact me. My email is in the description below. We can do an interview um, just to add some support to your channel and um, yeah just reach out if you guys haven't already please make sure to subscribe like this video if you liked it make sure to put your thoughts and comments in the comments below also make sure to share this and i'll talk to you guys later